Well, welcome back to this Constant Contact series that we continue to add to every week. Um, this week, we're going to consider another hard question. It's really a two-part question, so we're going to explore the first part this week. And I think that it's important to say that this um, question came out of last week's sermon when we talked about in Malachi um, chapter 4 that uh, the Lord's judgment is coming like a fiery furnace. And so I wanted to explore this notion a little bit more. The idea of is hell for real? And then the follow-up question is, or does everyone go to heaven? Um, over, uh, it, it was kind of strange because in... 2011, when I had my first call in Kansas City, I found these multitude of books. The first book was this one. is called um, it, it, Love Wins by Rob Bell, who kind of pushes the gamut. He gets pretty creative in talking about this concept. And ultimately, he presents what we would call um, really more so universalism, if I remember correctly. Um, some people might suggest that it's a Christian universalism, but based off of Rob Bell's theology and how that he has moved away from Christianity, I would, I would probably suggest that he's on to universalism entirely or that everyone is saved regardless of their belief. Um, I then read uh, a follow-up book that was kind of a direct response to the first book called uh, Erasing Hell, which ends up at the more orthodox stance of ultimately people will be saved if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and then finally, I came to this last book of which the question is based upon is, is um, hell for real or does everyone go to heaven? And this is a series of different articles compiled to answer this great question. And, and although it might be the shortest of the three books, it definitely is the shortest. Uh, it was probably the best writing of the three um, but I, I was really caught by this question, um, and ultimately the idea that it's become pretty popular to either ignore hell, or lately even in, in circles of theology, we've begun to see this idea that hell is simply finite, it's not eternal. And so I think it's very important that we're able to address this question and the first part of that question is is hell for real and the next week we'll explore the notion of, does everyone go to heaven so is for hell for real well according to the bible and and to jesus especially the answer is yes absolutely um now i will say that most of our western view of hell is actually formed more by a fictional piece called Dante's Inferno, in which we might have biblical illustrations of what hell looks like, but Dante's Inferno kind of takes it to a whole new level, and especially around the depiction of hell being fire and brimstone. Now, while such imagery is used about hell in scripture, it is only one of many depictions of what hell looks like. Um, so I'm going to try to track the imagery that the Bible portrays of hell throughout the Bible. The first one that we'll address is Sheol in the Old Testament, and then there's kind of an evolution from Sheol to Gehenna in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, Sheol, if you were to put it simply, can be seen as the underbelly of the earth and the place where people would go to rot and die. Um, now, there is an interesting connection that the serpent who tempts Adam and Eve, and of course Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruit, in the consequence and in the curse, um, God tells the serpent that he himself will crawl on his belly. And then imagery later on in Revelation, we see about how Satan falls from heaven to hell or to the underbelly of the earth. Now, since though, death and separation from God is ultimately the punishment for Adam and Eve, and of course, of when they ate of the forbidden fruit, it is no surprise that Sheol would be described primarily as the house of the dead as personified in Proverbs chapters 1 through 9. 
Sheol can then be referred to as times as either that underbelly or even the pit. In Ezekiel 28, we see the prophet warn Israel by saying, Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Because you think you are wise as God, I will now bring against you a foreign army, the terror of the nations. They will draw their swords against your marvelous wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to shale, or bring you down to the pit, and you will die on the heart of the sea, pierced with many wounds. Will you then boast, I am God, to those who kill you? To them you will be no God, but merely a man. You will die like an outcast at the hands of foreigners. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. In other words, Sheol becomes a direct contrast to Eden. In Eden, humanity has need of nothing. But in Sheol, humanity is banished and disgraced from the mountain of God and thrown to the ground which is reduced to ash. And of course, in Genesis 3.19, and this is all connecting Malachi to Mark in terms of celebrating Ash Wednesday and remembering this, Genesis 3.19 says, You are ash, and to ash you shall return. Sheol is the underbelly and the separation from God, then become a type of enemy bunker. One article from Desiring God put this puts it this way for maybe some of us token fans. It says, Sheol is a place from which there is no escape. The gates are locked, the windows are barred, and the prison guard de um, death is undefeatable through human effort, as related in Job and Isaiah. The gates of hell are kin to Mornon, the black gate of Mordor, unassailably guarding Sauron's territory in the Lord of the Rings. Human beings on their own cannot escape, only something unexpected, entering in the realm of the dead and breaking down the gates from the inside, could ever hope to defeat both Sheol's gates and their master. Storming the gates for humans, though, is futile. Um, moreover, Sheol becomes a type of ex uh, exilic wilderness where the people are separated from God, much like Israel was while they are in wilderness under Moses or in exile under Babylon. Or, to put it another way, if Sheol is um, connected to Eden, then Sheol can equally be contrasted to the Promised Land. While the Promised Land offers milk and honey, in Sheol the only meal one can eat is dust and ash. And further, instead of God being praised in his sanctuary, there is no praise of God in Sheol, and the dead do not remember him. Psalm 6, 5 said, For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from Sheol? Who can praise you from the pit? Who can praise you in the wilderness? These two pictures of Sheol already make it bleak, but then especially the prophets begin to see separation from God and God's judgment as a flame that will separate the shaft from the fruit and consume the thorns and the buyers. In the series we just finished, that is Malachi 4, says the day of judgment is coming burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed. This directly connects us from the Old Testament to the New Testament in this idea of Gehenna. Gehenna was a literal location that was a place to burn people's trash and excrement, much like factories burning off unneeded fuels. Uh, fuels. Such a dump was the dirtiest job one could receive and where maggots and worms abounded, and they were, that's where they found their food, right? While Gehenna itself was finite, Jesus takes the finite reality confined to a certain place and time to a whole new level. And he does so specifically in connection with God's judgment and the Lord's day. We begin to see how our ideology of this English word known as hell begins to form from the multitude of imagery that Jesus uses, and this is summarized so well, I use this on the sermon on Sunday, from an article in the Gospel of Coalition by Leslie Schmucker. In, in it, it says, Jesus doesn't only reference hell, or you may say Gehenna or Sheol. He describes it in great detail. 
He says that it is a place of eternal, not as finite, but eternal torment of unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die, where people gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, and from which there is no return even to warn loved ones. He calls hell a place of outer darkness, comparing it to, as we've just been talking about, Gehenna, which was that trap dump, trap, trash dump that we've already talked about. Jesus talks about hell more vividly than he talks about heaven and describes it um, even more <laughs> detailed. There's no denying that Jesus knew, believed, and warned about the absolute reality of hell. So it absolutely blows my mind that there is a new movement that claims that hell is finite, even though Jesus used such eternal, encompassing imagery in the way that he describes suffering, torment, the ongoing judgmental fires, that anguish and gnashing of teeth that never ends. I mean, su such an argument has to do quite a bit of mental gymnastics to get around this language. And ultimately, if they go that direction, it is odd to me that they really want to embrace the idea of an eternal heaven, but the language that is often this age to age or eon to eon that's talked about in reference to infinite and eternal is the same language used about heaven as it is for hell. So essentially they're just saying this is what we like. We like Eden. We like the promised land. But we don't like judgment. We don't like ongoing fire and therefore we don't like hell and we're going to throw it out with the bath water. But in doing so you've thrown out your entire argument for both heaven and hell. Um, really the Bible allows no room for this. It, the Bible is very clear. We can I, either know heaven or hell. We can either know the blessing or the curse. We can either know the promised land or ash. Or to ultimately receive Christ or face eternal consequences. There's no middle ground. And we would, do realize, we would do well to realize that if the gates are locked from the inside, then we need an external agent to save us from the outside. Hell is most definitely for real, but we'll explore next week the notion of God can determine who is going to heaven. I've often put it this way. We are all destined for hell. We're all destined for a lifetime without God. But in Christ, we are predestined for heaven. So we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Um, as for this week, um, I'm, I hear you. We are called to brace ourselves for this winter storm. So maybe enjoy watching this video as you watch. Even now, I'm seeing the snow starting to come down. Uh, but also, at the end of the week, I uh, hope that you already have your tickets because they have sold fast uh, to our production clue. Um, I challenge you, and as I do with every production that we have here, is, is maybe you've invited a friend or a family member, and maybe you would have an opportunity. Of course, we're having a dessert available at most of the clue showings. Um, but maybe to take that family member or that friend out for dinner beforehand and to talk to them a little bit about, you know, well, this play is happening at a church. What, what's kind of your been your experience with church in the past? And just curious, you know, like, tell me a little bit about your faith journey, these types of things. And you'll be surprised what types of things you begin to hear. So I challenge you to do that and to take the opportunity to uh, be interactive, to be proactive in the way that we live out our faith. Pray that these videos continue to be a blessing. Um, tomorrow, Ash Wednesday service will be canceled because of this upcoming snow, um, but I am going to put together another video um, that hopefully blesses you for not being uh, in person at the Ash Wednesday service. So I'll have that uh, out for you probably tomorrow afternoon. I uh, pray this is a blessing for you. Uh, God bless. We'll see you soon.